Okay, good morning everyone uh, and can I welcome everyone to the seventh meeting of 20, 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Uh, can I remind everyone to turn off mobile phones or other devices to silent mode uh, so that we don't disrupt the meeting. Uh, we've had apologies this morning from our Deputy Commissioner Paul McNeill, MSP, who can't be with us. We're hoping to have the rest of our members here uh, in, in short order. And we now move to agenda item one, which is decision to take item in private. The committee is asked to agree that item four, consideration of the draft personal specification for members of the Poverty and Inequality Commission is taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? Thank you. And uh, we now move to agenda item two, uh, which is an evidence session on pension credit. The committee will take evidence on the forthcoming changes to pension credit, which we'll discuss shortly. And can I welcome Rob Gowans, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, and Adam Stakura, Head of Policy and Communications, Age Scotland. You're both very welcome. Thank you for coming along th this morning. Um, there's no open statements this morning, but you'll have plenty of opportunity to put, put your views on, on, on the record, so I'm just move straight to questions on that basis. Now, we know that there was an announcement in January that mixed age couples um, were only one on receipt of pension credit for new claimants will cease to qualify for uh, pension credit entitlements and will have to make claims under universal credit, and that will be from the 15th of, of May this year. Um, I was looking at the policy rationale of the UK government for this, uh, which was actually back in 2011. The alarm bells did start ringing when I realised that it was Chris Grayling who was the minister in charge of uh, policy. Uh, so I, I have no surprise that we are now uh, panicking and deeply worried about what the impact will be on pensioners, given his track record in government. But it has been reported that um, it will affect up to 115,000 uh, pensioners or pensioner households uh, up to £7,000 per year. But what I didn't see was any kind of breakdown of those numbers or you know, any projections in relation to um, what that means for Scotland, for local authorities in Scotland, for the regions of the, the rest of the UK, in order to plan ahead in relation to what this will mean for pensioner poverty um, in Scotland. Any comments in relation to what your expectations are in terms of the impact on, on Scotland? Uh, Mr just, Takura? Just from the, the top, really, as soon as the announcement was made back in January, on the same day as one of the meaningful Brexit votes was kind of snuck out through a written statement, the first thing that we looked at was how will this affect Scottish pensioners? And the questions with colleagues from our sister charity, Age UK, to Department for Work and Pensions and Ministers were asking that specific question, for which there were no answers. Even at the time of the announcement, uh, there was no breakdown as to how many people do they anticipate it will impact in the first year, this coming financial year. It took a number of weeks for the Department for Work and Pensions even to announce that. So the decision was made in the first instance without actually knowing the numbers of people it will affect. But there is still, as we can see, no breakdown in terms of how it will affect Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales or other regions of England. Mr Gowns, have, have you got any idea what this, this could mean for no numbers of uh, households in Scotland? Um, we don't have a, a sort of a, a great deal of concrete information either. Um, um, we would be able to go and would be the, um, the sort of initial DWP impact assessments, which um, this um, SH Scotland have pointed out, um, doesn't go into a great detail in terms of the breakdown. Um, sometimes the estimates will will sort of vary quite a bit, um, a bit in practice. So the short answer is we uh, we don't have a lot of a lot of information on that. In terms of the impact on on households, without knowing the number of households, if you aggregate the UK figure of savings to the UK Exchequer by the year 2024, 2025, that we do have numbers for, it's effectively almost 1.1 billion pounds. Uh, taken out of pension households during that time. What kind of impact is that likely to have? So, in, in, um, at a household level, um, the um, the switch to universal credit could cost people around four, 140 pounds per week. That's um, to seven thousand two hundred eighty pounds per per year. Um, the average will um, is. There's, there's mixed estimates of, of the average between sort of 5,000 and 6,000 um, 6, per year. 
Um, in terms of the, um, we're quite concerned about the about the financial impact. Um, pension of poverty has been reducing in Scotland for the last um, the last twenty years. Um, sort of currently, it's, it stands at about um, about thirteen percent. Um, as one of the um, the aims of pension credit is to um, um, is to lift pension out of poverty and, and to support low um, families on a on a low income. It's difficult to see sort of universal credit um, under those circumstances having having the same the same impact. Okay, and our, our briefing paper in preparation for this morning's meeting uh, tells us that there's already a disappointing take up rate in relation to pension credit. Would you have any concerns that uh, as these changes are are becoming known, it might actually dissuade? individuals or households from seeking to apply for pension credit who might qualify even under the un, under the new rules? Um, I guess the, the, the short answer is that we that we don't know for sure. Um, so pension credit as you as you say is sort of, um, at a low take up rate. Um, sort of one of the things that that we are doing through um, through our work through um, the financial health check service and um, and the work of CABs is to try and encourage people to uh, to claim all the benefits that they're they're entitled to, so that would that would include um, sort of pension credit and sort of universal credit if they if they apply. Um, it may be that um, that uh, there is some concern, certainly in terms of um, where um, people have been, um, but sort of previously entitled to pension credit and through different circumstances would um, have to claim universal credit. Um, tended to find that um, that clients would prefer to claim pension credit mainly because of the the the, the simplicity of it compared to the um, the claiming and um, an ongoing management process of universal credit. Okay, Mr. Secura, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, Camino, just to pick up on your slightly earlier point as well. I mean, we always think this will have a devastating impact on the finances of the poorest pensioners in Scotland. You know, there's various estimates, but you've said in your opening statement that it could be up to seven thousand pounds a year for those who are already the poorest. And um, the actual the DWP figures that were released recently say that there'll be across the UK this next financial year fifteen thousand people. In mixed age couples, this will affect for new claimants. The following year, it will double to 30,000 and then 40,000 the year after. And our sort of assessment, if you took the most rudimentary kind of mathematics of around about a 10% population share, when you're looking at actually Scotland's a slightly more aging population, um, you, you're actually looking at in year one, the cost of this is actually only, in terms of supplementing these people, only £11 million. Pounds. You know, in the grand scheme of things, but they'll have a devastating impact on the poorest people. And pension credit is essentially the threshold upon which the UK government decide that's the bare minimum that pensioners should be able to survive on. So it will have a massive impact in their finances, and not just the um, on, on this sense, but there's lots of passported benefits as well. You know, if you remember this time last year, we're batting down the hatches for the beast from the east. When the temperature plummets below uh, zero degrees for a week, people get an extra twenty-five pounds a week to use their heating when it's that cold and these are the kind of most vulnerable people and we found last year was the the highest increase in excess winter deaths in 20 years i mean i'm sure the two things are are related there's council tax reduction there's housing benefit as well which are all passport as, as part of this there are help with health care costs such as glasses and and dentistry so there's more knock-on impacts to to this in itself and actually you know 40 percent of people don't claim pension credit you know we've found in January, since this was announced in January and February, a 142% increase in phone calls to our free helpline asking about benefits and entitlement checks, which is a staggering increase. Something that we try and promote all the time is free checks for people to make sure they're getting everything they're possibly entitled to. So it's obviously caused a bit of a panic thus far because people don't know where they sit. And our big mission is to make sure as many people as possible sign up to pension credit before the 15th of May so they won't be affected. I think that's a very helpful comment to put out there publicly. Um, it's worth pointing out, Mr Stakura, that I had a constituent come to my surgery about a week ago. I was discussing this with, with, with members in private before, before this session. It's appropriate to put this anonymously on, on the record. Um, who hadn't received any information. He was about to uh, become a pensioner uh, or qualify for, for the state pension in the normal way uh, in the next couple of months. And 
didn't really know what was going to happen, hadn't been informed that he would now qualify for a state pension, and there was just confusion out there. And then he'd read reports in the media about issues around pension credit, and there was just absolute confusion, to be honest with you, and, and worry. Is that perhaps what you're, you're identifying with the additional calls to your helpline? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, the takeaways from it will be that people have called it because it's been in the news. There's a change to something to do with pensions or some kind of benefit, and a lot of people don't know what it is. As I said, 40% of people don't claim it to begin with. They don't know if they're entitled to it. I mean, I was speaking to a gentleman, again, on an honest basis last week at a meeting of older people in Glasgow, and was telling me, OK, he's 70, his wife is 60 and working. The first person I spoke to about this in terms of they're a mixed-age couple, on a very low state pension, didn't actually realise he might be entitled to pension credit. The first thing he was going to do was call our helpline to go and see, but realised there's this 10-year gap, his, particularly if his wife will now, because of the rise in state pension age, could be six, seven years until they'd be able to claim pension credit. If you consider that £7,000 a year kind of impact for that number of years, that's a significant amount of financial support to people which they'll be missing out on if he hadn't called or has, I mean, I don't know his exact circumstances, <laughs> if he would be entitled to pension credit, he thought he might be, but our team would certainly be able to help him. But it just shows that well, the impact could be many, many years of missing out on quite a lot of money for people who are at the poorest, poorest in our society. Okay, final question, I'll open it up to other members, come to Mr Griffin next, just to, to, to give my heads up in relation to that. Are those who do currently qualify and who would apparently not be impacted by, by, by this because they, they, they're in ahead of the May 15th cut-off date, if you like. Are they also at risk in terms of a change in circumstances? Because one of the propositions that was, was put to ourselves was that if someone who is of working age wants to take up a, a part-time job, for example, and that would impact on paying, understandably, pension credit entitlement if there's more money coming into the house. That's a positive thing, that someone who's below retirement age can be, can be active within society, but that would then be a, a change of circumstances. And when that person then sought to, maybe didn't get that job, but maybe it ran for six months, for example, when that household then sought to reapply for pension credit, they would therefore be ruled out, is my understanding in relation to the proposals as they currently stand. So are there those currently in receipt of pension credit in mixed-age households, what if there's a change of circumstances, they will also lose out? Is, is, would that be your understanding, Mr Gowns? Um, I think your understanding is correct. I'd need to go away and, and double-check that, but I think that, that sounds broadly correct. Yeah. It, Mr Stakura, are you aware well, of well, slightly, just slightly beyond that point in terms of change in circumstances, when it was first announced, there was a mass confusion about you know, that if someone had a break in their claim, i.e. they moved council area, there'd be a break in their claim, therefore they would no longer be entitled to pension credit. That has since been clarified, I understand, by the Department for Work and Pensions to sort of revoke that, that break. But there, there, might, there was still some confusion over, and I, I'm sure it'd be a, only not too many people, but if they were, for instance, out of the country for six weeks, then their claim would be broken. You know, those people might be in receipt for that, let's say, for instance, they went to go and visit their family in Australia. You know, as an example, they paid for them to go over there and they came back and the break in claim would mean they came back and they would no longer be entitled to the, the kind of the, the, what they were used to in pension credit. So there were more, there was more confusion at the time, but some of it's been clarified and some of it hasn't. OK, all sounds deeply worrying. Uh, thank, thank you for, for those comments. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Convener. If I could just continue the Convener's line of question before um, Mon briefly. You mentioned the, the impact this will have on passported benefits as well. This isn't just about um, what people would lose out in pension credit. You talked about council tax reduction, housing benefit, cold weather payments. Do you have an illustrative figure of what a household could potentially lose? And I'm thinking about in areas with um, the, the higher uh, local housing allowance rates and higher council tax levels in, in our cities. Do you have a kind of illustrative figure of what um, a household could potentially be losing out on in one of those um, high-cost areas? Um, it'll, it would vary um, by area, I, I suspect by household circumstances as well, um, when we've seen people who are transferring from or moving from legacy benefits to universal credit. Um, sometimes they can be better off, often they're, often they're worse off. Um, some of the passported benefits um, 
that you mentioned would also be um, someone who received universal credit would also qualify for, so for instance, cold weather payment and um, um, and council tax tax reduction. So um, so it, it it would vary by by circumstances. Um, um, I haven't seen any sort of detailed detailed modelling of it. Um, but um, yeah, so it would it would it would depend on circumstances. I think in just our, our, um, our haste for preparing for this committee, um, we may not have that illustration just now, but it's a fascinating question, which I'm happy to go and discuss with colleagues back at Age Scotland, perhaps work up a hypothetical example of some of the things we might know and, 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 and send us back to the committee. OK, that, that'd be helpful. Thanks. And the other area of um, question I wanted to pursue is just to see whether any, any of your organisations or sister organisations at a UK level um, had considered uh, legal challenges at all to this policy. We know that there are an un a number of other policy decisions under the Welfare Reform Act which have been subject to legal challenge. It seems um, fairly discriminatory to say to one person, you qualify for pension credit um, because your partner is a pension agent and you don't because you happen to be married to someone um, who is a different age. That seems to me fairly discriminatory. And just my last question I'll squeeze in. Are you worried about that this could potentially drive um, behaviour change um, and, and people choosing whether or not to be um, in a formal partnership? Just on the, the legal challenge part, I'm not entirely sure. I'll try and seek clarity, but it's certainly something which might have been considered. Um, the, on the, the first instance, because the nature of the legislation, our first thought when discussing this with colleagues at Age UK was actually it'll probably require primary legislation in the House of Commons to, to change this. And that would probably be the, the best way, I guess, if the government, UK government realised this was a, a retrograde move. Um, but I'll certainly find out for you uh, and see what that is. But I know it's obviously a huge, it could be a very complex issue, but we might not have that answer right now. And on the behaviour change, Part, um, you know, it's if you if you look at the examples of the amount of money that someone will have if they are single compared to being living in a mixed age couple, they would be far better off. You know, relatively speaking, it's still not very much money living alone, and that's a hugely disappointing position to be in when you actually would be better off as one of the poorest people in society living apart from your partner. Um, I think that's, you know, it's scandalous if that was the position that people had to be in. Thanks, Kevin. Mr. Gary, did you want to add something? Um, we're not uh, sort of currently uh, considering a legal challenge in terms of behaviour change um, from uh, universal credit. We have seen situations where um, where people would be would be better off um, living separately and claiming claiming individually um, than they would be as a couple. Uh, that might extend to, to cases where um, where people would have previously previously um, been in receipt of, of pension credit, um, but we'd, um, we need to sort of wait and, um, and see on the cases the cases coming through, but, um, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we do see some, some cases where that, that occurs. Okay. Um, Al Thrallon, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Just a quick question, really, and it was just, um, uh, given all the issues that you've raised, it was just to establish what you you thought the impacts might be on devolved areas of, of policy or areas that were under the <laughs> Scottish Government's responsibility? Well, I think it's in the first instance, actually, if people have a lower income, they're more susceptible to poor health conditions. And um, actually, find, as we, we found out, the excess winter deaths at the highest level in 20 years, just from the last year, um, for lots of different reasons, you know, not least the, the terrible weather. But if they can't afford to heat their home, they're more likely to be in poor health. The older you are, you're more likely to have more health conditions. So there'll be more stress on the NHS. But beyond that, if people can't afford necessarily to live in their own home or can't afford to live healthily, there might be more stress on social care mm -hmm. sectors already under, under particular stress, whether it's recruitment, retention of staff or whatever else. So there are lots of knock-on impacts to, um, to devolved areas, not least there may be more applications to kind of Scottish Welfare Fund um, for kind of crisis payments. There might be um, more use in food banks. Uh, there are lots of things which this could impact, um, either unintentionally or, or otherwise. So without putting any words in your mouth, it, it would be fair to say that the Scottish government, government may end up picking up the pieces? I think you'll find that um, 
the Scottish Government very well could be picking up the pieces in Scottish Councils too. Thank you. But Gaines, did you want to come in? Um, only that, that um, lack of those points, it's um, that, that there will be increased pressures on the Scottish Welfare Fund on crisis services um, and on sort of wider wider services such as such as health. Okay, is that you finished, Mr. Allen? Uh, Michelle Valentine. Okay, thank you, and officially good morning. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, this was legislated for in 2012. So, do you know what kind of um, information was given at the time? Um, what kind of witnesses were taken, and what kind of um, sort of submissions did, say, your organisations make at the time, and, and what response did they receive? So that's the first half. Um, the second half is around, obviously, what we're talking about here is where there is a mixed-age couple, and what one individual is still um, technically part of the potential workforce. Um, and what have you looked at in terms of the consideration, because pension credit, if, if the younger partner is working, 100% of cre cre pension credit is eliminated by their earnings, whereas obviously you have the taper rate in universal credit, so potentially you, you get to keep some of it because you, you've got that 63% taper rate. So have you looked at those impacts? And what would be, I mean, if it, given that it is a, a reserved matter and it's legislated at UK level, and you've said there about Scottish Government ha having potentially to pick it up, and you said earlier that you felt it wasn't a huge amount of money across the board, have you looked at whether or not you think we in Scotland should do something specific around it? And if so, what? And how would you, you phase it in, say, someone who is of pension age but has, say, an MSP for a partner who's younger? And do you think we should be paying larger amounts to that individual where their partner is earning what I think we would all agree is a fairly decent salary? So, you know, just looking at it in the round, what consideration have you given to those sort of things? Um, yes, to, taking those points in turn, in terms of the, um, the sort of Welfare Reform Act, I mm. wasn't at Citizens Advice Scotland at that time, but had a look back through our, our submissions. Um, the changes to the mixed age rules weren't something that we, um, we particularly focused on, um, although um, the, the Welfare Reform Bill brought, um, brought a large amount of, of changes mm. To, notably the, the introduction of universal credit and personal independence payments that require a sort of number of other issues that um, that we um, that we were focused on at, at that time. Um, in terms of the taper rate, uh, yes, that's, that's entirely correct. And I think um, earlier I mentioned that people, um, when people are um, moving from legacy benefits to universal credit, sometimes they can be better off, sometimes they can be worse off. It would vary in terms of people's circumstances, um, really if um, if their other partner was um, was in work. Um, in terms of mitigation, um, as like other things, it would be it be theoretically um, theoretically possible. Um, the the most uh, simple solution would be to um, not to to sort of apply the rules at at UK level um, mitigations. And sort of very invariably gets um, gets gets slightly complicated. If there were particular if there were particular proposals, then um, um, for, for doing so in Scotland, then um, then we would uh, sort of consider those and and um, and uh, see what um, um, what might be the might might be the fairest approach. But um, say it it would likely be be sort of a more complicated solution than, than not applying the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, ju uh, just on the, um, I'm trying to remember which, which way around the question was, um, you sort of said, it, yes, it's not a huge amount of money in the round, but it's a huge amount of money to the individual or the couple. So yeah, sort of my clarity mm -hmm. on, on, on that. Um, and I think part of this is really to go back to the principle of, you know, um, so, so looking back to 2012, I'll, I've been trying to have a bit of a dig around. Obviously, it's reserved policy and our sister charity, Age UK, will likely have made far more submissions than we had. I've only been at East Scotland mm -hmm. for a year, but we'll, if you if you want that, I'll happily seek some clarity mm -hmm. on that. But what we do know, the Scottish Government um, had funded some project work from East Scotland in 2013 to talk about and publicise changes 
-hmm. to this. It had happened. But one thing to remember is the Welfare Reform Act was, uh, and, and the work there was 182 pages, mm -hmm. of which the mixed age couples part was buried somewhere in the middle. Or, or you know, you know, where do you where do you look for the tree? You know, in, in the wood, kind of part. Um, so it'd be difficult to kind of pick that out in the whole because of the the wide ranging you know, welfare reform stuff. So I will I will seek some clarity on that. But it was it was buried buried away. And I think when we look at the kind of people who are calling our helpline to inquire about pension credit, mm -hmm. um, the chances of um, being from a household of considerable wealth, which may be your hypothetical example, let's say it was an MSP and someone else is very slim that these people that we are speaking to. So our kind of analysis of that would be that we do not encounter that as such on, on, on a wide scale. It's these people who are contacted because they are desperately poor. No, my point was, would, it, would you see it as a universal benefit regardless, or would you, would you want it to be targeted if we were going to do something in Scotland? Probably I'll spend a little bit more time to think about it. I think looking at the round of it, it's probably simpler to keep it as a universal mm -hmm. um, benefit in that sense. But remember, universal credit wasn't designed for people of pensionable age, whereas although you know, um, pension credit wasn't designed for people of working age, but that's why we're looking at the kind of converse exactly. of that. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not designed for them. And, and the impact of mm -hmm. this, um, and hypothetical examples, were definitely fleshing out. And we'll find more, sadly, there'll be more examples of how this is really impacting people after May the 15th. Mm -hmm. um, which is really, quite frankly, a position we don't really want to have to be in. But we'll probably have better examples then. Okay. okay. Anything else, Michelle? No, not at the moment. All right. Okay. Uh, Reserve Alison. the option to come back if there is. Is that the Well, we, we should mm -hmm. hopefully have time. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Alison Joyson. Yeah, I was just sort of following up um, on that point. Age Scotland, you do say in your submission that um, while the UK government says that pension credit wasn't designed for working age claimants, that universal credit uh, was certainly not designed for pensioners. I mean, do you find it quite strange that, that this is the route that the UK government has gone down? It's a certainly disappointing route. Um, and whether it's an unintended consequence or just a consequence, you know, it's, it's certainly disappointing. <laughs> I'll have, and I said it'll have a devastating impact. And I think that when it was snuck out and, you know, trying to, you know, we are really disappointed about this, so some of the language we might use in that sense might seem a bit cheeky, but I think it was snuck out on the meaningful vote day to think it was, it, it'd be under the cover of darkness, mm -hmm. that no one will know this happened, but we picked up on it immediately, and we're angry about it, actually. So it does, you have to think about the justification of the UK government, why did they put it out then, hoping that no one will notice, and not notice it was too late. And as we've been working back through the kind of legislative approach to reversing this, if there was the will, it would require primary, primary legislation, we should take a, a heck of a long time to do, and there's probably not the will right now in the House of Commons while Brexit is dominating everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's a really disappointing approach from the UK government, and they could change it if they wanted to. From a citizen's advice point of view, uh, Mr Gowans, do you think this is going to increase your workload? Do you expect to have people coming in? Um, it's certainly got the, the potential to. Um, um, see, mention universal credit is a benefit that's primarily designed around around work and um, getting people into work and searching for work um, there's there's probably a, a sort of couple of um, a couple of aspects to reaching people of pension age onto onto universal credit that <coughs> that be concerned about one is around um, we don't quite know yet how um, how conditionality will be applied to the other partner. We do know that um, um, that people have, uh, who have retired would be expected to search for work, but we don't quite know how work coaches will react to someone who's um, who are a couple claiming universal credit. Um, one person is of working age, and what their work search requirements will be. Um, we know that the, the majority of people who claim pension credit have a have an illness or disability. Um, it may well be that there's there's quite a number of carers amongst the um, amongst that um, uh, amongst their partners, and we don't know about the, their own partner's health. The other aspect that we'd be concerned about is around um, is around digital um, digital um, exclusion. Um, ready with. Um, with the introduction of universal credit, um, which, um, as the the, sort of the the committee will likely be aware, is um, is designed to be um, claims are made to be uh, made on and managed online. 
um, we've seen sort of a, a sort of large number of um, people who um, who aren't able to cope with that and um, and require require support um, from surveys we've done with CAB clients um, previously, which has highlighted um, the uh, the need for digital support and and uh, the large number of people who um, who wouldn't be able to uh, with making and managing a benefit claim online amongst older people um, there's a far larger proportion who who would struggle to do so um, instance um, uh, from our research um, uh, whilst over um, two-thirds of those aged 18 to 24 year olds um, reported being able to use a computer very well. Only 12% of those aged 65 to 79 were able to do so. And conversely, um, only 3% of, um, of respondents aged 18 to 24 reported not being able to use a computer. That rose to 38% of those aged 65 to 79. So it's quite likely that um, the um, increased issues around people who, who will uh, sort of struggle to make and manage a, a claim online. Yeah, so that's a, a significant barrier and mm -hmm. one which might make take up even lower mm -hmm. um, amongst people who really need access mm -hmm. to this additional income. Um, the Age Scotland submission also says that the changes to pension credit are also likely to have a greater impact on women. Um, and we know that already pensioner poverty is more significant um, for women. So could you expand on what you think the potential impacts are there? sense as we're seeing even with kind of the waspy women that the state pension age is getting further and further away from them so they are it's taking longer and longer to get there and actually in fact for a lot of women who might have had career breaks or not work for large chunks of their lives when you look at the generational part their state pension will be a lot lower <coughs> than the kind of the, the kind of the basic or the kind of top level so pension credit will be vitally important to bring them up to that level so these are kind of these generational factors perhaps to begin with which have massively impacted women and as yeah as state pension age increases for them it will become every year that goes on they're one step further away from from being receptive <laughs> and, and and the financial support they need do you like to comment on that issue mr gavins um i don't um it's not um anything particularly particularly further to um further to add to the to what um age scotland have said okay thank you thank you convene okay keith brown um <coughs> Oops, sorry, I point. I said, Keith Brown, I was trying to give you a signal, Mr Balfour, I'll take you in after Mr Brown. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not as subtle as it should have been, perhaps. Keith Brown. Uh, first of all, given the way the conversation's gone, I should maybe declare an interest in as far as my partner's a Minister for Older People, although neither of us are at pension age yet, although people will be able to tell I'm much closer to it than she is. But, um, uh, and also, you know, when I, I had made the suggestion that the committee should look at this area, and I didn't know some of the things that have come out and it's a kind of sense of unfolding horror to hear things like you'd said Mr Stakura um, a direct a devastating impact on the poorest pensioners and also what you'd said about people now might find it more of an incentive to live apart even with their partners I think is is horrifying but going back to the earlier point that you made about the lack of any if I'm getting this right any impact assessment before this was done um, I'd just like to get a sense of what conversations did happen and whether, in your experience, and I know you said you've only recently joined Age Scotland, but citizens' advice might have a view as well, is this the norm, this, this lack of any kind of impact assessment? And how, how do you perceive the idea that we're now told that austerity is over in 2019, and yet in 2012, 2011, when this was thought about, we were at the height, if you like, of austerity? I know they don't seem to have moved with amazing alacrity to bring this in, but why, if austerity was over, do you think this is coming in now? Have you any sense of that at all? I think in the first instance, the, um, the, the rationale why it was kind of snuck out is kind of lost, lost on us. But the, the, the initial um, conversations we might have had with the UK government, and especially colleagues at Age UK will have had, uh, drew blanks in terms of that impact assessment. It did you know, beg the question. One of the big flags for us at the time was, well, if they're announcing this now, they must know how many people affects it would be good to know how many people as we've put out it affects in scotland so in terms of our interests what the financial costs will be it was colleagues at age scotland at, at, at my, sorry age uk had come up with, with us to the seven thousand pounds a year kind of impact on, on the costs so that it didn't come from the government um i just 
and as I said, in our written, it's written submission, I've been an example of a parliamentary question that was asked to one of the pensions ministers, the Secretary of State for Pensions, actually, a written question which did outline back in uh, 21st of February that they still didn't have any kind of regional breakdown. Hence, in our written submission at the end, we've done a, the rudimentary maths on what that could mean. It could be higher, it could be lower, we don't really know, but then you think about every year after that, if it was 10%, it's going up. And it does, it does uh, you know, beggars belief that such a devastating uh, impact on older people's lives is done so publicly without really any proper rationale. That was what the thing we found really, really disappointing. And in terms of previous uh, examples of this, I can't really speak to that, not really in my wheelhouse. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the welfare reform, um, as I mentioned, there was, um, it seemed to sort of get quite, uh, Quite sort of limited um, limited coverage at the at the time. Um, I suspect that was because um, of um, the sort of the large amount of changes that that were being being made. Um, in terms of the impact assessments, then um, um, sort of a number of the a number of welfare changes have had uh, sort of impact assessments that um, of a, of a similar nature that. Um, Particularly thinking of the the sort of lowering of the the benefit cap, where there was quite a a very um, large ballpark figure given for for the UK, and some of the um, some of the other impacts didn't seem to be um, didn't seem to be taken into into account. Um, in terms of why it's been um, being commenced now, I'm I'm not entirely I'm, I'm not entirely certain. It was, I'm seeing something that was um, that was uh, that was passed by the UK Parliament uh, seven years ago. Um, it's not entirely clear why um, why it's being being commenced commenced now rather than um, rather than at uh, at another date. It's it's certainly been. Been something that we've been we've been aware has been in the in the legislation and um, particularly in, in conversations with um, with Age Scotland um, previously about when it might might be commenced. Um, so my my suspicion um, had been that it it sort of wouldn't um, wouldn't be commenced for a long time if at all. So it was it's, um, I have to say it's sort of um, not for the first time was uh, my predictive skills were slightly out, but. Um, but yes, it's, it's not entirely clear um, sort of why why it's being faced now, and it's, it's certainly in terms of the the kind of the case for the for the policy is is um, I'd say it's sort of is, is not a not a clear picture. Thanks for that. I think you're probably right to say that when that came through, the Westminster Parliament, there was so much that was going on, and a government really intent on uh, the various austerity measures, perhaps this wasn't the one that attracted the most attention, which makes all the more puzzling that seven or eight years on, they've come back with real teeth, uh, which I think is an attack on the poorest pensioners. But on the point that you made earlier on about the passported benefits, this would have an impact on presumably the mitigation on bedroom tax that we have in Scotland and you mentioned council tax reduction. So in effect, this could be a real triple whammy. And in addition to the £7,000, this could be, uh, I mean, you mentioned the fact that pensioner poverty had been reducing in Scotland, but this in itself and its knock-on consequences could be a major setback in that attempt to try and reduce pension or poverty when taken together with those other passported benefits. I would have be right in thinking that. Yeah, I think the, uh, since you're looking at pension or poverty, I mean, there's, there's various, I, I was looking at last year's report from the Scottish Government that put out about 17%, I think it was, for pension or poverty, about 170,000 old people are kind of in, in that level. And we know from our own research, for instance, on a single measure that, you know, those single pensioner households, six and 10, can't afford or have real difficulty paying their energy bills, for example, and for those couples, it's you know 40 percent. We know that um, from our own research from Money Matters project that 38 percent of people of the age of 50 are financially squeezed in Scotland, and there's about three and a half percent that were struggling, like really struggling. So that's again this kind of this, this 40 percent seems to kind of capture lots of things with, this, with regard to this just now. Um, so it will have big problems, and actually the the point you make about um, the bedroom tax and the mitigation that the Scottish Government have implemented with regard to that through discretion housing payments and, and whatnot will this actually yeah you're right this will potentially have an impact there too, and it shows that the Scottish Government obviously have committed to in the general terms mitigating against welfare reforms 
uh, for those of working age. I think part of one of the things we've said in our written submission is that consideration should be given to, to mitigation for those who are not of working age. Mm -hmm. Two, it's not the best position to have to be in if it's the Scottish Government, but if, the, if the, these uh, commitments have been made elsewhere, then it would probably be reasonable to do so elsewhere. But you know, primarily, this is a mess made by the Westminster uh, UK Government. Mm -hmm. Okay, just before we move on, Mr. Gowings, do you want to add anything before we move on to the uh, well, I think the, um, it's, uh, it's got the potential to have an impact on um, discretionary housing payments and, and mitigation of the, um, of the bedroom tax, um, given that, um, that that would be, that would apply in universal credit, but not, not pension credit. Um, but it'd be sort of unclear at this stage how, um, how great that might be. Um, so don't know how many people would be. Um, would be affected by that. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Vinay, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, just two or three questions. I mean, I think just going back, I mean, I think if you look back at 2011, um, there was actually full debate on this and the amendments were put down to reverse it. So I, would, I suppose one of my opening questions is, we've known about this could happen for the last eight or nine years. How much have you been working, or have your colleagues been working with UK government to either change this or for some kind of amendment to be put down by another? You know, you, 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 you're portraying this as, and I understand it's a very serious issue, uh, and, you know, oh boy, it's just suddenly been announced. Well, we, we've known about it. it's going to happen at some point in eight years. So I'm just wondering, what work have you and your colleagues been doing in Westminster if this is so difficult to have it reversed? So the second question is, is going back just a wee bit to explore a bit more um, the issue that if this was, it, it should this be a universal benefit? Because I, I, I totally accept your point that the people phoning in your helpline are not the people who are in the situation where one of their partners it, you know, may have a reasonably high salary. But I suppose just looking forward, if this was to be reversed, is it your view that it should be universal? And then the third issue, and Mr Cowan said it's theoretical. Well, it's slightly beyond theoretical. This parliament, under the legislation we passed under Social Security, has a power to create new benefits. That's a power that we have and can use any time we want. I, I suppose the question for me is, if, I, are you, would your plea be to Scottish Government that this is going to have such a devastating effect on all the people in Scotland that they should be introducing new legislation to reverse this here in Scotland? Because that is not a theoretical issue, it's a, a very practical issue, it's a, a political decision that can be made. If, 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 if you're telling us as a, as a committee, if, if you're saying to the Scottish Government, this is going to have such a devastating effect on all the people in Scotland, then we should be seriously looking at, is it, should it be new legislation we introduce? And so my question around that is, is it that serious that we should be looking at putting through legislation through this parliament to reverse this change. Is it that serious? You've quite clearly set your stall out, Mr Balfour. I would have let you back in for follow-up questions, but you seem to have rolled them all together there. So um, we can maybe indeed chew your way through the various questions that have been asked. Mr Stakur, I'll take, take you I'll first. I have my pen with me. I've, I've, written, them, I've written them down. Um, in, in terms of the work that might have been undertaken, uh, especially at the time and since then, with regard to the UK government or what's been going on in Westminster, I'd have to consult with colleagues at our sister charity Age UK as they would lead on those kinds of those kind of things. But we have said before, since then we've Age Scotland had been and have been heavily promoting to older people themselves the need to make sure that they are getting all the benefits and entitlements that they are they are due and the Scottish Government had helped fund some of this work back in twenty thirteen to make people aware aware of that. I'll I'll try and seek some clarity. But what I will also say is that, you know, sometimes older people's issues aren't top of the agenda. Um, with all the political white noise that's going on. And actually, you'll find that at Age Scotland, there'll be others at Citizens Advice and other charities will be fighting battles on multiple fronts every single day. You know, just last week or two weeks ago, we'd be, I'd be looking at hospital reports, or then, then it was, you know, those five different media interviews doing on five different issues at the same point. Not to, not, not saying that it's always that busy, but there are lots, lots of things too. So I'll certainly consult with, with people there, but our mission is to be get as many older people as we can to make sure they're getting everything they're entitled to. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to, to benefits too. On the universality, I think the point I, I sort of made earlier on on this is that it's, you know, it's, the current system maybe isn't working for everyone just now, those, those poorest pensioners. 
um, because there is 40% of them that aren't, aren't getting it. So, you know, at the same point, why don't we just keep it where it is just now and try and get more people onto it? You know, there is a mess <laughs> behind this with all the passported benefits. It's not just, I don't think it's just as simple as, because, uh, yeah, just as having, for instance, a brand new benefit in one, because there are lots of, as, as Mr Griffin and others have, have, have mentioned, that talking about the passport benefits, there is quite a complex web of elements and support for older people out there. But the, the means tested benefit and pension credit is the gateway to them. So I think it would be a really tricky one. I'd probably be on my brief right now in this committee after the kind of best part of a week to prepare for it, along with 55 other, other battles to fight, uh, to, to have an answer to that and certainly something that we might consider in the future. Um, what we would say is that it would be great if the Scottish Government and this Parliament and this committee considered what it could do to mitigate um, on, on, the, uh, on the simplest measures, maybe one step shy of, of full blown benefits, but there are still a range of benefits that are due to come in and being worked through, and although some of them have been delayed, there are a number which will be impacting older people too, and how will this fit in that schedule? And we're working now, the consultation's now open on the equivalent of attendance allowance as well, so there will be, be a range of things this Parliament will have to consider. It will be particularly difficult um, on, on that basis. Through those questions, Mr. Gowing, just before I take you in, because the, the question mm -hmm. is, is about mitigation. If you add up the loss of benefit entitlement projected over the next five years at a UK level, that's £1.1 billion pounds using the, the rough pro rata that I, I suppose that, that, that the sector have been doing in relation to this. That's over £100 million pounds additional mm -hmm. monies that would have mm -hmm. to be sourced in Scotland in the next five mm -hmm. years, which may, of course, uh, come from other projects that might mm -hmm be seeking to tackle pensioner poverty mm. and support older people such as adaptions in their mm. homes or or, or, or mm. whatever. Um, so mm. these things are never cost free options. Um, but Mr Gowans, I really mm. appreciate you trying to work your way through the Mr Balfour's mm. questions. Yeah, um to um in turn, it's not something that we've um certainly not in the last um in the last two or three years we've we've particularly done a, a sort of a huge amount is engagement with uh, um, with the UK Parliament on this issue, um, sort of our focus has particularly been on the on the introduction of, of universal credit, the rollout of um, personal independence payments, um, some of the changes in the um, in the Welfare Reform and Work Act um, 2016. Um, in terms of our um, our work with um, with MPs there. Um, in terms of the the, sort of the universality of, of pension credit, um, there, there's potentially in, in the sort of the sense with with pension credit is like with other benefits. There's there's potentially tweaks that could be um, that could be made to it. It's certainly the case that um, the the person who would um, who would qualify would be of a, a low income typically because um, they didn't. Um, have uh, very much of a private pension or 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 no private pension at all. Um, in terms of um, in terms of mitigation options, then um, then like like on a number of other issues, then um, we would um, on issues that that we would be concerned about, then um, we would be sort of equally. Delighted if the UK government or the Scottish government were were to take action, I would that the sort of um, that mitigating issues is is generally more more complex than than um, the problems at source. To to get from mm. both of you is, I mean, absolutely to the convenient point, this would come with a cost. Mm. What I'm trying to work out is is this such an important change that that is a cost that the Scottish Parliament government needs to think about. I, 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 I'm generally trying to work out, is this, I, I appreciate people will lose, there are going to be losers here. What I can't work out, is this so important that we need to mitigate on it? Or is it taking your list of 20 somewhere in the middle? And, 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 and that's what I'm trying to get a sense for from here, is that from, your, from the people that you're working with representing, is this the number one issue that you're com you're concerned about, or is it somewhere in the middle? Or you know that, that's what I'm trying to look for, so that we can have a feel of, of how serious this is. 
I think the um, it's a really good it's a really good question. I think I'm slightly going to pivot around on that. I think there are about 20 hugely important issues to older people and different older people, it will be the most important issue to them. I generally do think this will have a dev devastating impact on older people. I stand by that. Our charity stands by that. And yes, that every effort should be made to find a way to mitigate against this. It will be very difficult. What I'm not saying is that is the, the first priority of the government. But I think it's certainly incumbent upon members of the Scottish Parliament to recognise how important this is and to look at ways upon which it can be fixed. Obviously, there will be challenges for the Scottish Government in this sense, with lots of other things going on. There will be challenges for local authorities in this sense, with challenges for this committee and members in this parliament on that. But yeah, this, is, this will have a devastating impact and, and kind of as a question, yes, this serious action should be taken to, to fix that. But I go back to the point that there are huge issues affecting older people every single day. And for different people, whether it's dementia or anything, um, they will be the most important issues uh, too. But for, let's say it's 1,500 people next year in Scotland, that will be one of the most important issues to them because they won't have to choose between whether they use their heating, they pay different energy bills, they can live in the same place, they can travel anywhere, they can engage in society, that their health is good. You know, that for them it will be a substantial issue and for us we're taking this deadly seriously. And I said, this is just something that's, you know, snuck, was snuck out in January. Yes, point taken that it was been in the works for a number of years. Um, but no indication of when it hits, so you kind of fight the battle that's in front of you at the time, and now it's one that we've got kind of in front of us, and we'll do everything we possibly can to make sure older people sign up in advance of the 15th of May, and I'm sure there'll be a cross-UK approach with the UK government on change this in the first instance, but if not, it's really upon the Scottish Government and this Parliament to, to look at how it will fix the problem. OK, Mr Gowns, do you want to, do you want to add anything on that? I'll wait at one supplementary from Alistair Allen, then we're moving to Shona Robinson. I'll say to members that we'll run this on maybe by another 20 minutes or so if there's additional questions folk want, 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 want to ask. So we'll, we'll, we'll take both of both them brief supplementaries, please, mm -hmm. uh, Alistair Allen and Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, but Mr Gowans, do you want to just add something before we bring members in? Yeah, I think in terms of the... Um, if we were to, to sort of pick a list of, of issues that would be as our, our sort of top priorities to be addressed... I think it'd be fair to say this: the the big stage rules wouldn't wouldn't be at the the top of the list, but there are the list would include um, sort of a, a sort of a, a sort of large number of issues that um, that we're we're concerned about. So I'd, um, it, it, I think it's probably a, that wouldn't be seen to to kind of sort of underplay the the sort of the the impact of. Um, Sort of of this change, I guess part of the um, um, part of the difficulty that you know, is that with so many so many changes is where um, where you would um, we would mitigate whether there's changes at, at sort of UK level. Um, I guess probably um, some of the things to to sort of on its head is to. Um, I guess probably paraphrase the, the the Social Security Act that Social Security is an investment in people, um, and um, there are of any of these changes there are knock-on impacts elsewhere, leading to the Scottish government's budget, but also to the sort of the UK government's budget and and um, local authorities. So um, so that sort of spending some uh, some money on um, on areas such as um, such as sort of, um, sort of protecting um, protecting pension credit would um, would save save money elsewhere. Really interesting line of questions. I said we've mm -hmm. got a couple of uh, uh, bids for supplementaries. I would certainly be concerned that that's a bit of a false choice that has been discussed there because I wouldn't want to run up the white flag and surrender every time a UK government had an attack on uh, poverty <laughs> levels and pensioner poverty. Uh, in Scotland or right across the UK and work on the basis that we just seek to mitigate uh, what is a deeply unfair and unethical policy that's been propagated uh, from London. So I think maybe a bit of, from my point of view, it's not a question, but there's a false choice been, been offered there, but we do have a couple of supplementaries in relation to that. Um, Alistair Allen? I suspect I'm going to say the same as you, convener, and it's probably more of an observation than something I'll draw you too deeply into unless you want to comment on it. But uh, I think you know, it just has to be recorded that you know, Mr Balfour won't be too surprised at me raising this, that you know, what he's talking about here is that in instances where his government, the UK government, cuts uh, something in their area of responsibility in Scotland, 
um, that the Scottish Government should be expected continually from its own resources for health and education to find a replacement to, to pay for uh, that, that cut. I just want to observe that you know, if we were to do that every single time that the UK Government cuts something within its own areas of responsibilities in Scotland, we wouldn't have to trim devolved services, we would have to end some devolved services. Uh, the amount of money coming out of the benefit system, I have seen the figure quoted many times now, is equivalent to what we spend on Police Scotland. So um, I don't expect to comment on it, but I think the question from Mr Balfour, while understandable from his point of view, was a rather loaded one uh, and avoids the issue that I've just mentioned, which is that taking his advice on that would involve us shutting down whole areas of services within devolved responsibility. Uh, I have to say, uh, I don't expect to, to respond to that. And we're all together, Michelle Ballantyne's question. I would say, and uh, on the record, in defence of a Conservative member of this committee, it's an absolute valid line of question of whether we agree with it or otherwise. You absolutely have the space on this committee to, to, to explore that, but other members have clearly got a significant variance of views. Uh, Michelle? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm going to respond to that slightly. Um, my understanding of committee is it's not about us debating our own views. It's about exploring what is going on, taking evidence on it, and trying to, to get a deeper understanding of what we're looking at and how it impacts and, and what kind of decisions we should make as a Scottish Parliament going forward and, and, and as part of that to advise the Scottish Government on what this committee has found and thinks around it. Um, so I, I guess it, you know, that, that line of questioning were, was trying to understand how deep a problem this is and how much weight, as you so eloquently put it, in the, the mass of things that, that we're all looking at and we're looking at all the time. And I guess when it comes to Social Security in Scotland, um, part of what devolution is doing is giving us, as a parliament, the opportunity to create a social security system within Scotland. And, and some of that is not about just saying, oh, well, we don't like what they're doing in the rest of the UK, so we're going to mitigate it, because that, that would be a false premise for a Social Security Scotland system. It's about devising and, and building a social security system that is based on what we want to deliver. So, uh, you know, the reason I asked you the question about should it be universal is because actually part of this is saying how, for me anyway, is about how do we target the people who need help and ensure that the money we have, which is limited, and I don't think any of us would disagree on that, but how do we ensure that that money is targeted to the people who need support albeit either for a short time or, or permanently throughout their lives, to ensure we get maximum impact where it's needed. And therefore, when we're looking at something like this, what we're really trying to do is assess what is the level of impact? Is it split? So yes, it'll impact on X number of people, but how many of those people does it put into poverty? Does it seriously impact their ability to live a reasonable life, one we would all expect as, a, as a, at least a minimum standard, but I guess when you get to pensionable age, you don't want to reduce people to a minimum. So therefore, I suppose my question is, how much work do you expect your organisations to be doing on this in terms of, of independent work that we <coughs> as a parliament can be looking at? Um, because that, I think that is quite important because it's not, for me, it's just not, not about mitigation. It's about what are we trying to build here and who are we trying to help and how are we trying to help them? I had asked for, and I include myself in this, I had asked for brief supplementaries. It Sorry, that wasn't that, very it brief. It seems like an age since we've um, <laughs> mm. uh, heard from the witnesses and there's quite a lot of views wrapped mm. up within that rather than necessarily scrutiny questions. I should also point out, and I'm doing this to take up your time as well, I should point out for your full understanding this committee is able to scrutinise any aspect of social security, irrespective of whether it is a local authority, Scottish government, UK government, and to make recommendations right across the board. We are not limited, and I think that's important in terms of uh, the responsibilities of this committee. Mr Gowans. Um, I think on the, on the first question, I think there's a um, some point around, um, I guess, around sort of pension credit generally and... Um, and its universality. We haven't done a great deal of work on sort of what potential changes might be to um, to pension credit. We have done on a, a sort of range of, of 
other benefits, particularly the ones that, that are that's be, being devolved to help um, to help inform the committee and the Scottish um, and the Scottish government. So, um, so that that's something that we would um, that we would need to look at in further detail. Um, in terms of the the impact, some of the um, um, having a look through um, sort of cases that come to, to CAB to see what what sort of some of the the impacts might be sort of on individual um, on individual couples. Um, the there's the sort of couple that that sort of um, I think are worth drawing to the committee's attention. In in one case, the um, the client um, received the wrong information about which benefit to claim and. Um, claiming universal credit rather than rather than pension credit, which they'd have been entitled to, um, it had an impact on the client's finances so much so that they um, ended up requiring support from a food bank. Um, the client received a state pension, but the money had run out, um, and they were part of a of a mixed age couple. Eventually, the CAB was able to to sort of backdate the claim for pension credit and give advice and additional support. Um, the backdated claim was six thousand six hundred and fifty pounds, which um, shows some of the some of the loss. Um, the other case was um, where there was a sixty-seven year old client who lives with a forty-nine year old partner. Um, she's disabled following a stroke, and her partner's unemployed, and they were left in serious hardship due to a um, a seven-week delay to a pension credit claim, which. Um, which some of the, the cases where there's been a delay to, to pension credit perhaps mirror the, the waiting period for universal credit. Um, they would have just um, a sort of state pension of 134 um, 34 pounds a week. So I think some of those are the types of situations that we would we would expect to um, be providing advice to people on. Um, so those are the kind of circumstances mm -hmm. and hardships that may happen after mm -hmm. May, May the 15th. So mm -hmm. that, that's pretty clear. Adam Stakura. The assessment on the kind of the examples, I absolutely agree with. Um, the, I think when you're looking at pensioner poverty, the anyone that's going to be impacted by this after after the 15th of May, or most of them, will then be put into poverty because pension credit in itself, and I said this before, is the kind of the, the government's minimum, the benchmark, to top up to get to this. You know, what is it, 163 pounds a week for a single person, or 248 pounds 80 a week. For a, for a couple. So actually, by its very definition, um, all these people are, you know, depending on how the household is, is structured in terms of the other, the other person, but would that individual would go under the poverty level. So it certainly will impact impact significantly. Um, and the universality, I've just gone back to my original point about there aren't enough people claiming it. Just now, your point made about the kind of vision of this parliament or the Scottish government or Scotland in terms of how it designs a social security system fit for the future is a good one. I mean, the, I think the actual Scot uh, Social Security Scotland kind of um, the style of it is far better than the Department for Work and Pensions in terms of how it is to treat people. It's also how it's to be as accessible as it can. And the point was made earlier on as well about the kind of the, some of the barriers. If you're looking at how universal credit will roll in, there's half a million people in Scotland over the age of 65 that do not use the internet. I've used this in a committee the other week to, to, to make the point. They don't, that's the population of Edinburgh who don't, so their barrier immediately to kind of even claiming the right things and having access to information. Our challenge as a charity is to um, to proliferate the advice and the, the kind of means upon which someone can sign up to getting the entitlements that they are due. And I think one of the recommendations we would say and have is for the Scottish Government, for members of the Scottish Parliament, is to amplify these campaigns or be part of them for massive benefit uptake campaigns. On the, road, on the whole, pen, um, social security budgets aren't always fully claimed. You know, there is a massive underclaiming anyway, so there is there is money there. If there was a maximum uptake, then it would obviously stretch these things. But there is money there by that very basis. So there is there is certainly room to, to expand. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Uh, Shona Robinson, in a second, I want to say to members, there will be the opportunity for brief, and I stress absolutely brief questions, hopefully brief answers, uh, for just a mopping up exercise. But the final substantive question of, of this morning, Shona Robinson, MSP. Yeah, uh, good morning. Um, given what's just been said about building that social security system in Scotland, uh, and given the concerns about the ability to mitigate given the fixed budget, wouldn't it be better for pension credit to be devolved so that we could build that social security system uh, in a wraparound comprehensive way for pensioners? And isn't it the case that 
we will already have to mitigate the effects of that increase in pension of poverty that you've just described through mechanisms like the Scottish Welfare Fund, which is already a £33 million fund. Do you think there'll be additional pressures on that fund? So, in effect, having to, to mitigate the, the impact of that, that uh, UK government uh, welfare uh, change. And just briefly as well, do you think there's any level of awareness among the pensioner population or the population at large about these changes coming in from the 15th of May? And if not, what can be done about that? And finally, do you hold any a breakdown of information uh, beyond the Scottish level. It, it's been quite hard to get a breakdown of local authority area, for example. Is that? I, I suspect the answer is, is likely to be no, but I thought I'd ask anyway whether you have that local information. Uh, I'll, I'll go and still writing. I'll go to Adam Stakura <laughs> first. I just, I just no, please keep writing. It's fine. <laughs> My notes page is running out of white space now. Um, so good questions on the kind of devolving uh, pension credit. You know, I think part of this is if the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament feels that it's able to effectively legislate for all of these new benefits, then, then yes. We obviously, you know, there's no judgment on this, but there have been substantive delays to benefits or the devolved benefits that are being devolved, being worked on anyway. There's a number of years changed. There's obviously challenges in how, how all this works anyway. But I think if the culture of Social Security Scotland must be applied, then that would be better for, for pensioners, I'm sure. Um, so it's a bit of a non-answer to that no, just, just no. now. Mm -hmm. um, kind of pressures on the kind of Scottish Welfare Fund, yeah, there will be. Um, but again, people might not know it exists. And that's one of the challenges as well, to know it exists there for the kind of guy that's crisis grants or whatever else. That is a challenge for lots of people. They don't know. We obviously have said this a few times, we don't know if enough people know the help that's available to them. They could call our free helpline number, free benefits check. And last year we helped um, Scots uh, pensioners or older people, um, anyone over the age of 50, kind of get another, another £600,000 of unclaimed entitlements. They were due. That was last year. And this year we're on, on track to beat that. And there'll be others that will will do similar similar exercises. The um, it was, as I mentioned just before you came into committee, just to, just to re reaffirm the point, was that uh, as soon as older people found out these changes were coming into effect, um, so in January and February, there was a 142% increase in the number of calls to our mm -hmm. helpline, specifically about benefits and entitlements. And obviously, we can track calls back to the kind of news that happens. This is when older people are seeing the news, they'll call us up. Or we've been in the papers or on the, on the radio, on the TV, talking about these things. There is a an immediate response for people calling up. So that shows the level, and we'll be speaking to, you know, not just on benefits entitlements, but you know, we have about a thousand people a month we'll speak to in general through our helpline. Mm. So well, that's not exactly transferable. There's a 142% increase in those people calling about benefits entitlements in that period when this was announced. So it does show that it has spooked people mm -hmm. and they're asking what they can do. Are they entitled? And we are desperately uh, making sure that we get more calls in, we can get people kind of signed up to the right benefits and entitlements. And we will be, over the next number of months until then, running campaigns and outreach work with older people to make them more aware of what they can do to be ahead of the, ahead of the curve on this uh, particular one. And uh, sorry, I've forgotten your third question. Now. It was about local breakdown. Or... Yeah, so the, um, uh, as far as we've been able to get is just an overall UK picture. Mm -hmm. of 15,000 uh, people, older people in the UK next financial year, 30,000 the following year, 40,000 the year after that. And I put in a written submission that our most basic maths, if you took 10% cut of that, you could kind of see what it means. But beyond that, there certainly has not been. And uh, if the UK government have had challenges in whatever way of being able to break it down to, to nations or states or even regions of England, I'm sure they'll have a big difficulty doing so. Uh, by local authorities. I mean, it might be helpful as uh, this begins to impact on uh, um, pensioners in Scotland, maybe even through your helpline, to be able, if that creates a bit of a picture of where there might be particular pockets of pensioner poverty arising from this change, presumably you would be gathering that, and that would be something I think the committee would be quite interested in looking at what evidence sure. emerges of the of the impact over the next 12 to 18 months, for example. I'll um, speak to colleagues uh, at Age Scotland and the help them about how we capture that information, how we might be able to collate that for the future for the committee. That'd be helpful. Um, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we... Um, <coughs> 
um, we don't have a, a sort of a, a detailed um, a detailed breakdown either, but would would be happy to um, to sort of share information with the with the committee once um, once the the sort of changes come into effect. Um, in terms of um, in terms of devolution, um, at the time of the the Smith Commission, we um, we supported um, the the devolution of um, sort of all social security benefits outside of pensions, um, and it's um, it's also um, that um, we've been supportive of the approach that the. Uh, that the Scottish Government and the, the Scottish Parliament have taken to the development of the new social security powers. Um, as probably if there's if there's proposals for for further devolution, then we'd we'd see sort of comment more on them um, when they rise. Um, in terms of pressures on the Scottish Welfare Fund, I would um, from what we know, I would say it's quite likely there will be greater pressures on the, the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, and as um, uh, as Adam as has said that um, one of the issues is that we that we see at the moment is people aren't always aware of the of the Scottish Welfare Fund or the help that they can get from that. Um, um, so that um, we would um, we will sort of try and uh, try and sort of promote um, promote that through through our work as an alternative to uh, to sort of food banks or other sort of unsustainable means, um, but also. Um, promoting take up of, of pension credit and council tax reduction as well, which are uh, both um, particularly low amongst older people. Um, if we got anywhere near to sort of full take up of those, then um, sort of pension poverty wouldn't nearly be eliminated in Scotland. Um, so, um, so we're um, see, to try and uh, to raise awareness of the change, but also to raise awareness of the. Of the social security support that's that's available to people that um, that are in need of it, um, um, yeah. And I think that was I think that was all of your questions, um, or at least the ones I've got written down. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, now let's. I keep saying we're going to f finish this session, but I just think there's a few things we should mop up. So I've got two or three, hopefully brief questions I, I want to raise. So and other. Please, please feel free to do the same. Can I, can I, can I, can I just check? Um, it would take primary legislation to halt, uh, so for for others to halt this. But would the UK government wouldn't have to? Would the UK government have to go back to the House of Commons and, pre and present primary legislation to stop this, or can they stop the enactment of this via an executive order? My understanding of it is that the UK government would have to enact primary legislation rather than just a departmental decisions not to do it kind of thing or, or anything in between that that's my understanding right okay I, I think it would be helpful for us to, just to get absolute clarity on, on that because there's a difference between House of Commons taking control of this issue this issue and seeking primary legislation to effectively scrub it from the statute book or the relevant UK minister saying the government who decided to trigger this provision now also has the the ability to to terminate this provision because I think there's probably a balance on committee that would, that would quite like to see that happen. Um, okay, so that's unlikely to happen in, in, in short order. So it ain't likely to go away by the 15th of May. That's real politique, unfortunately. You mentioned an uptake campaign. Are you aware of a, a UK government uptake campaign? You know, apply for pension credit before you lose it. Um, it's part of, uh, it's a bitter pill to swallow, the £7,000 going out of some households every single year, but a real targeted UK benefit uptake campaign to get beyond that 40% uptake that we currently have. Is there any information in UK government intent in relation to that? Um, I'm not um, really aware of specific ones on pension credit happening at, um, happening at UK level. Um, certainly in terms of um, we'll be trying to communicate information about the about the change, um, I'd imagine that the the sort of the UK government would probably sort of see it in see it in different terms in terms of um, that um, they would regard it as a as a good thing that people were um, uh, that uh, the reason for this this change or they um, or they wouldn't be bringing it into force. Um, 
on your earlier point about the um, whether there's, there's kind of changes to the, the regulations, my understanding is that, that it's being commenced by regulations, whether it can be, um, um, I hesitate on this one because I'm not a lawyer, is whether it could be uncommenced by regulations, I'm not sure. So, 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 so we have to find out, mm. and so there's no evidence of an uptake mm. campaign, but aware of, so mm. just for brevity, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't bring Mr Secura in on that. Um, so mixed age households will then fall into universal credit, that could mean conditionality. So, are we in reality, talking about the sanctioning of pensioner households now. That's something the UK government could rule out if it wanted to, isn't it? It could, it could have light touch or no conditionality on those households, even if it moves to universal credit. So, are we talking about potential sanctioning of pensioner households under universal credit? Um, understanding is that um, is that the uh, the pensioners themselves wouldn't be required to. Um, wouldn't be required to seek work um, or have work search requirements. Um, however, we don't know how that will apply to to their partners, um, as the entire um, amount, household amount of universal credit um, is sanctioned rather than um, as it's paid to the the couple. Then, then yes, you could but, you could potentially have. But ultimately, the if Job Centre Plus decided that. Um, the, work, the working age person who may actually be looking after um, the, 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 the pensioner um, is, is, is fit for work and can work and they're not trying hard enough to get work. I, I hate saying these words, quite frankly. They could sanction that, that the income to that household. That's a new thing, mm. isn't it, for I a think pensioner for, household? For brevity, the answer is probably yes. Right. Okay. Pretty worrying. Um, final thing on passported benefits. Is there... Again, whilst I would rather we just kept things as they are and May the 15th wasn't happening in terms of all the enactment around uh, mixed-age households, is there a way of flagging up under the universal credit system uh, uh, speedily that any universal credit household that has uh, a person as part of that claim who is of pensionable age would automatically accrue the same passported benefits? Is there a way to, to, to fix this passported benefit issue? I don't have an answer to that just now. I'll seek to get one for you. We understand why we, we would yeah. be asking that, mm -hmm. because there, there's another way of... <laughs> mitigation cuts both ways. Can we, we would rather not have the bad lot, but can we make a best of the bad lot for as, for as long as it exists? And that, that, that's an obvious route. Mr Gowans, any ideas um, about that? It's something I can, I'll, I can go away and have a look at what options might be. OK. Um, Additional questions from, from members? Um, Keith Brown, MSP. I'm just wondering, Convener, do we get the chance to make a couple of observations subsequently, or should we make those now? Or are there still questions? Uh, uh, OK, so if there are any more questions, and I, I know I did ask a few there, but I did try to be as brief as possible, I will permit them. Um, we will have the ability to uh, discuss our impression of this evidence session uh, in private. One, 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 once it concludes uh, in, in, in theory and we could decide whatever actions we wanted to take. I mean, and there's a variety of actions so we can, we can correspond with Scottish and UK governments and we can be as diplomatic or we can be as hard-hitting as we like as a committee, but there's other mechanisms at, at our disposal uh, which I know you're aware of, uh, Mr Brown, um, which might set precedence for committee, which we may or may not want to do. Um, so we're ruling in, in, in the committee members' hands. Are there any more questions at this point? Yeah, if I could, I, Keith Brown. Try and, I'm very happy for the answers to be brief. But I had intended to ask whether um, you believed that the bedroom tax, tax exists or not, because that might seem incredible, being a subject to debate at this committee, but you've both mentioned it, so I assume that you do. Um, we've, had, we've had a mention of the fact that this is an important, or Jeremy Balfour's raised the question, is this an important change? And you've said it's a devastating impact on pensioner poverty, uh, and also the prospect of forcing uh, pensioner couples apart, plus the, the prospect that the convener just raised of sanctions being possibly applied. So I think that kind of answers the question. And to me, it just seems absolutely barbaric that we would try and do that kind of thing. But the bigger question that was then raised by Jeremy Balfour was, should this be mitigated by the Scottish Government? Which, to my mind, it would be interested in your comments, since it raises the question of how somebody can hold two views, that they would support this devastating attack on pensioners and yet support its mitigation. 
I, I don't know how you can hold those two views um, together at once, and it'd be interesting to have uh, your, your view on this. Um, and presumably, if there was to be further mitigation, that would have to come at the expense of something else, so whether it was council tax reduction or bedroom tax mitigation. Um, you, the point you made, Mr Sticker, about how, how complex the system is already um, just makes an absolute nonsense of the idea, I think, put forward by Michelle Ballantyne, that we should set up our own system almost regardless of what Westminster is doing. It's obviously going to be shaped by the wider agenda of Social Security. And just to hear if you have any comments on that. I, I, I would not like to have a view on a member of the Scottish Parliament's uh, positions. Uh, that's for them, them to have. <laughs> If you'll permit me that. Answered uh, admirably, like someone who may should be sitting this side with, 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 <laughs> no with, danger. with, with diplomacy. Now, Jeremy Balfour, just, just before I, I, I take you in, uh, Clark has just pointed out that we technically don't have an item in private to discuss this matter. Um, I'm also minded that, um, given time constraints that we have in relation to this coming into place and the work we have in this committee, um, we do have the option, and it would have to be brief, uh, we, we do have the option to discuss in, in public um, what course of action we might want, want, want to take and put that on the public record. I would note that, um, that, that that requires a good degree of responsibility across all members uh, um, across the party divide as well of what reasonable actions would be. Um, I would ask members whether they'd be minded to do that, and I apologise to witnesses that I'm just raising this point of procedure at, at the moment. Do, do members think we, we, we should have a discussion um, in, in public over what, what a course of action might might look like? I'd be minded to do that. And, and, and any course of action should be challenging for all layers of government, not, not just one. But we should have a look at that. I, I, see, I see nodding heads. So we'll conclude the evidence session, not just yet, because Mr Balfour well, want, want, wants to come in. Come under more for common rather than... If we're doing an open session after this, yeah. I, I'll hold mine back for that moment. Okay. Um, well, 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 I thank members for for agreeing to that. As, as a public session, if, if, can I first of all, though, um, we'll stay on this agenda item mm -hmm. uh, and just checking that. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I thank both of you for being as formative as actually was possible in the circumstances in relation to the impact uh, this will have on older people who both your organisations uh, represent and support uh, in, in all our constituencies right across Scotland. And I think irrespective of our, our own views on this, we'd all like to thank uh, both of you and your organisations for the work that, that you do. Uh, please do feel free to stick around. There's, you're under no obligation to stick around for our discussion, but, but please feel free. There's no need for you to kind of leave the to, 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 to leave the desk, hang around, and you, you can listen to our observations. But at this point, what I would say is thank you very much. But your your role in relation to the evidence session would 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 would, would, would uh, draw to close at this point. So thank you, Th thank you both of you very much. Um, okay. Um, now we can have a, a, a. All members are going to have to be relatively brief, and I, I'll speak last. I've spoken enough at, at this committee. Um, what course of action would members think we should take based on the evidence that we? We have heard here today. Who, who would like to go first? I uh, see Shona Robinson. I mean, I think as a, a minimum, uh, we should uh, write on to the UK government on the back of the evidence session we've just had, citing some of the evidence about an increase in pension of poverty, the impact on things like the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, uh, and to. Um, Express our deep concern. Ask for you know a kind of eleventh hour halt to this um, madness, and to um, ask perhaps what uh, assessment has been done around the impact. What impact assessment has been done around the impact, particularly on Scottish pensioners, given our area of interest? Is is that? Um, and uh, you know, I think as a minimum. That's what we should do. Okay. C can I ask you, Shona, um, in relation to any letter, uh, whether or not we would uh, raise various themes that you haven't as yet mentioned? So, in relation to, for example, passported benefits, potential yeah. sanction, mm -hmm. and just list, um, j just kind of list them relatively briefly in any letter uh, to the UK government and the lack of clarity and the concerns that, that we have. But um, I'm conscious that um, I think it's reasonable to say that there. There, there's a majority on the committee 
in relation to these, these uh, May the 15th been, been delayed, cancelled, put <coughs> off, halted, should not happen. Mm. A majority on this committee, it might not be might not be unanimous, and I would rather not seek to go to a vote in what is an open discussion. So I would look at my, my Conservative colleagues and just wondering if, if their concerns are such that they would they, they would prefer the UK government at the very least postponed, if not cancelled, um, the, the proposals for May the 15th. I mean I think what I mean I think the questions that Shona are asking around the impact of this and um, the questions you are asking around um, sanctions, universal credit. I think all those questions are very legitimate to ask, and certainly would be very happy to sign up to mm -hmm. to those type of questions. Um, I mean, I, I am I'm, I'm not persuaded on what I've heard that I would be looking for this to be stopped. Um, so I think if you were writing a letter on that paragraph, um, I would prefer the majority of the committee are asking for this to be stopped um, rather than the whole committee. But if you're trying to get a letter that we can all mm -hmm. kind of sign up to, certainly the questions mm -hmm. that Shona has raised around... The, 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 I'm very happy for those questions to be put to UK government and we hope to get an answer back. I, I think, rather than having a long debate on this, the, um, I think the, there is an issue whether we then um, put this down the majority of the committee. I think this should not happen. But th rather than having to do two letters. I, I suppose the other thing I'd want to add to that is I do think, I mean, I think the point I was trying to make, which maybe Keith chose not to quite understand was, I, I mean, I absolutely understand the point that you're making, Kavina, that every, if a Scottish government does step into this, that comes with a financial cost. And it yeah. can't do everyone. I promise I'm going to let you ex extend on that point. It's just okay. that might be moving towards what, what, what representations would like to make to the Scottish government? So I wonder if it's possible just to kind of close off in okay. relation okay. to the UK. That might be a, a good structured way of doing it. Yeah. Um, uh, Michelle, take in a second. I would think that, and it's very helpful, your, your comments, uh, uh, Mr Balfour. Um, I, I think we can coalesce around the one letter. I just wanted to make sure whether in that letter we, w the line where we talk about halting this as a majority rather than the entire committee. And we've got that distinction now that it wouldn't be the entire committee. Um, so I, I, what I don't know is whether it's both Conservative members uh, don't wish to ask the UK government to, to halt these proposals. So Michelle, it would be helpful if you could let us know where, where yeah, you are I think, on that. Yeah, I think where I am, I think there's two elements. I, I think the first thing is we have to... Um, recognise that this is not retrospective and I think that's quite an important point so I think the the conversation we had about the uptake and, and ensuring that people have by the 15th of May actually engaged with their right to pension credit as it stands and I think I would in in the letter be highlighting that that we have a concern that people this is complex and people don't necessarily understand their rights and that we would be looking for to get reassurance that everything is being done to ensure that everybody who is currently entitled gets that entitlement. Because it's not retrospective, the impact is going to be on people going forward from where they are when one partner reaches pensionable age. And I'm not sure as yet I wholly understand what the the impact of that is going to be because it's not about taking money away that they currently have it's about not receiving money that they might have been entitled to had the change not been been made so i would certainly be interested in having a better understanding of what that might mean going forward so where are those households now and what is the impact going to be you know so so for somebody who's not already working for example who reaches pensionable age presumably the there's well, I don't know actually entirely whether there's going to be no change in their circumstance or whether they'll be slightly better off because some sort of pension kicks in over the top of it because pension receipts are not deducted from universal credit. However, I think that is something we haven't really talked about today and I think that is where we need to do it. And, uh, you know, our, our, our expert witnesses over there, I think that's the kind of research we need to understand. Um, so... I probably would share Jeremy's position is I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be calling for it to be stopped, but I, I do think it needs to be better understood. And whether that is asking them to say, oh, hang on a minute, that you know we could do with a bit more time to understand this before it's implemented. That, I think, is where I am. OK, I think that's, that, that, that's helpful with a, with a whole mm. discourse around um, 
be better understanding the numbers involved, the impact on, on, on pensioners and the lack of clarity that the third sector had that, that we had today. We do have to better understand that. I'm sure that could be in any letter. Uh, Mark Griffin, then Keith Brown. Thanks, I, I think we should write, um, raising the issues, a lot of the issues that we've heard and evidence really, really concern me around potential sanctions, uh, driving behaviour change, the, the whole impact it could have on our households um, income through that impact on passported um, benefits. And well, Michelle makes the point that it's not retrospective that actually a change in circumstances could uh, lead to um, an application um, being rejected. So it could impact on someone who is getting pension credit right now. If they have a change in circumstances, they will then lose that access to pension credit. So it, it, that that still could happen. I think if committee isn't going to coalesce around asking for a postponement to this decision, then um, I think certainly the majority of the committee should ask for the decision to be reversed. Yeah, that's very helpful. And we can reflect that in the one letter in a respectful way. Absolutely. Keith Brown? Yeah, I think uh, just a couple of points. Uh, first of all, uh, Jeremy says as part of the, his contribution, I chose not to understand. I would be really keen to get some clarity as to whether when he talked about the mitigation of this measure potentially by the Scottish Government, that is something which he supports and if at the same time he supports the continuation of community council tax reduction and bedroom tax mitigation, it would be useful to have that as a background. On the point about reversing, um, if it's possible for the UK Government in less than three weeks to get all through the, me the, Commons, the, the measures for Brexit, then it's perfectly possible for them to find a way to reverse this uh, decision. So I'd be very keen that we did make that clear. And I think we have to be quite unequivocal. There, there's little uh, option to choose to not understand the fact of what the evidence we've just heard. That this is going to be a devastating thing for pensioner poverty very soon. Um, and I think, and, and also the idea that we can be forcing couples apart because it makes financial sense for them to do that, it's just horrendous. Uh, and also the idea of sanctioning uh, pensioner uh, households. So I think we have to be very unequivocal um, and not mince our words and send this. And also, should I say, if this committee agrees to do something, the committee agrees, it's not a majority. When the Parliament agrees to do something, if, it, if the vote wins, that's the Parliament deciding, it's this committee. <laughs> anyway, the point I would make is similar to what uh, Shona has said, that. I was actually thinking whether we should actually make a, a statement of the committee's views in anyone, but this committee notes with grave concern the UK government's changes to pension credit and believes the view of Age Concern Scotland that this measure potentially having the effect of forcing pensioner couples apart and representing, in quotes, a devastating impact on pensioner <coughs> poverty requires this measure to be vigorously opposed. Therefore, the committee calls on the UK government to take all the necessary measures to reverse this decision until, at the very least, it carries out the impact assessment that it failed to carry out when it proposed this measure eight years ago. I, I think if those points are included, then I'd be happy to support the positions that we mentioned. Okay. In yeah. uh, uh, a, a, a moment, I will, I will take, take you back. I will take back. Take you, take you back in, Jeremy. Um, Alison Johnson. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very content to support proposals to write to both the UK and the Scottish government. I mean, I think given the Conservatives' long-standing, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I think most people believe that the Conservatives have always, you know, been very strong on the um, welfare of our older citizens. So I do find this an astonishing proposal, absolutely astonishing. And the fact that we've taken so much evidence on universal credit itself, and now um, it's going to impact on the lives of even more citizens, and particularly the evidence we took around the fact that it is digital by default. Um, for a group of people who find that even more challenging than I myself do, I, I just have grave concerns about this. You know, Age Scotland, in their submission, said that while the UK government says that pension credit wasn't designed for working age claimants, universal credit was certainly not designed for pensioners. So I think everything that we can do as a committee to highlight our concerns would be very worthwhile. And, you know, it is frustrating that we're constantly having to to look at mitigation of, of policies, but I think it'd be helpful to understand what the potential impacts will be on Scotland and on that welfare fund that may be called upon even more than it has been. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to see a, a genuinely increasing polarisation of, of views that might not be able to be accommodated to Alistair Allen. Well, I think that, that's true. I mean, I, I was really just going to observe that it may be that the, the clerks with their expertise can draft a letter which talks about the views of the committee um, 
somehow or other that refers to the fact that a couple of points that there were dissenting voices. But I, I would tend to agree with Keith that we should we shouldn't mince our words. That we should have a, a report that or not a report, a letter that speaks on behalf of the committee, if possible. OK, I think I have to let Jeremy in, and then I'm probably going to have to make a suggestion to the committee after that. But, Jeremy, could you...? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I suppose this is where I'm, I, I am slightly... I, I, maybe I'm not here, and, and if I am... I, I, I mean, I didn't hear that from Age Scotland today. I mean, that's why I asked for a very specific question. You know, and, and I think, for me... And, and so, what you know, when you say that... I mean, again, it's not fair because we're here and, and they can answer for themselves later. But my impression was from East Scotland, this is an important issue, but this is not the most important issue affecting older people in Scotland today. And so I think we've got to be careful with just with the terminology that we use. I am not saying it's not important. What I'm saying is I don't think it is... Well, they were very clear. It is not the most important issue for, on their agenda at the moment. I, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I can't... I mean, I would have thought the school of the clerks could put down a, a sentence uh, on a paragraph to say, just simply, the majority of the committee want to see this come to an end. And I, and I can't see that, that in any way weakens the letter that you would be signing. Uh, I mean, I think we're going to get into problems if, if we are going to then say the whole committee believe this, because I think, you know, we're going to enter territory that we haven't done in previous years, and we've tried to unite round letters. OK, so I think the committee has a couple of options here, and I've actually got a, a decision to make as convener. Um, the option is, as we write as a committee, and, and, and I, I think that may mean that uh, our Conservative... I'm not trying to not get that consensus, but it might mean our Conservative colleagues cannot put their names to the committee later, but I increasingly can't see how we can reflect the kind of language that I think the clear the majority of the committee wishes uh, to be in that letter that's going to get a consensus. Um, and uh, I'm seeking uh, to exercise my judgment as, share, as chair neutrally and responsibly, but I think I'd, it'd be remiss of me to say I just don't think, based on the views I've heard, there, there, there's a way of us all hanging together in relation to this issue. We therefore have two choices from what I, I can see. Uh, we draft the letter. Uh, we and this is a steer to the clerks whose job it is to draft this on behalf of the committee uh, and we make it incredibly firm and we don't talk about majorities we talk about the committee and if, and if, and if that just means the committee members sign that letter um, but our conservative colleagues cannot sign up to that they cannot sign up to that but the committee has a view and that can still be expressed in a letter and I'm just checking that's, that's competent in terms of procedure with the the clerks. In the letter. Okay, that can be reflected in the letter. The alternative, um, and Mr. Brown has effectively suggested a motion without notice, and I, I know she should be prepared some words there. Now, my preference, and it's for my decision as, as convener to decide whether to take a motion without notice, if we can get a consensus to draft a strong letter, which will encompass all the views that Mr Brown's effectively put in that motion without notice, had I decided to accept it, and we reflected in the letter that our Conservative colleagues can unfortunately not sign up to that, then we have a committee view and it goes to the UK government, because I'm very reluctant to accept a motion without notice, because I wouldn't want to set precedents in how the committee does its business. And again, I much rather prefer the committee has discussions and reflections of evidence in private, because you get a much more full and frank view from all committee members uh, for being really quite straightforward about it. But given the significant time constraints, the, in, in my personal view now, the impending uh, impact that we're talking about, um, up to £7,000 been taken out of pensioner households and then under the threat of sanction on top of that uh, deeply worries me and I don't think we've got the time to wait to make the committee's views known and I would rather do that in a letter rather than do it in a motion without notice which I think creates un unhelpful precedence although that would be in my gift so I would ask for the committee's agreement to take that course of action Michelle there was a, a note in our um, papers that the Work and Pensions Committee wrote to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions asking for more information about the expected impact in January. Do we know if they've received a response and do we know what it was? Mm. Uh, Clark's indicated that, that, that we don't know. 
Um, and we, we, we should solicit additional information on that. But what I'm clear about is, and we're about to talk about the Scottish Government in a second now, in relation to uh, impact and mitigation, which is the next topic that we have to go on and look at, of course. Um, I, I, I don't think we can wait. I think we have to decide that as Scotland's Social Security Committee, what are our views on pensioner poverty and these changes? So, yes, let's get that information, but I'd be minded as convener that we should not hold up the work of this committee in relation to that. So, with the caveats that I have suggested, um, can I suggest that we bring a letter back to committee uh, next week, which obviously will seek the approval of the committee, but Jeremy and Michelle obviously won't be able to sign up to that, but that will be reflected in the letter. I would just point that out. We may have to circulate that in that case then, given the, the time constraints, but we'll circulate that to all, to all members. It's very briefing convenient just to understand that uh, if a letter like that normally goes, and I generally ask because they haven't been involved before, then is it not just signed by the convener on behalf of the committee, or are you suggesting that we individually uh, sign it? And I just, think, well, we, we can do either. Right. Um, I'm happy just to sign it as, as convener, but we'll have to reflect in that letter the committee has agreed that, but note that uh, our Conservative members were not able to, to coalesce around that view. And just one final point of clarification. I don't think it was the case that Age Concerned Scotland said this wasn't the most important thing. They said there was a number of important things. That was uh, a bit of a difference. And it would be useful when we come back to discuss the mitigation, if it's possible to get an answer to the question, uh, which I posed earlier on, as whether it supported mitigation, the um, gentleman Michelle support mitigation of this measure, support the continued mitigation of council tax reduction mm -hmm. and also the mitigation of the bedroom tax, or not. It just helps a better discussion. At, can we come back to that discussion in the future? Well, well, I think we're about to have that discussion just now, Mr Good. Brown, because um, we are Scotland's Social Security Committee. It's not just about being challenging to one layer of government. It's about looking at all layers of government and putting challenges out there. Uh, but we have to decide where we are as a committee in relation to that. Um, so um, was it Al who was it I that started to talk about that? Jeremy, do you want to start off that conversation? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think... The letter I would want to write to Scottish Government is probably a slightly broader letter in that I, I totally accept your, the point that you've made on a number of occasions, Karina, that if Scottish Government mitigates something, that comes with a financial cost. And obviously there has to be a, a, a political decision of which ones we're going to mitigate and which ones we are going to mitigate. And so at the moment that there are two or three that the Scottish Government has chosen to mitigate on, and that, and that is a, a decision that the Parliament has made. It's a political decision that political parties come to. What, what I would be quite interested to know is, within Scottish Government thinking, within the kind of hierarchy of Scottish Government, is there some kind of thinking of how how do we decide which ones to mitigate and which ones we don't? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 what assessments are done at Scottish Government level in regard to impact, in regard to financial cost, in regard to because you know, I'm clearly not saying you can choose to mitigate everyone, but I think it would be interesting for us, from the Parliament and for this committee to know is how is that decision reached? Is, is it a, purely a political decision, we're going to do this, or, or is there academic research done to say that this has to be done or this doesn't have to be done? I, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think, I think there needs to be... Presumably there's some working done within the civil service on regard to this, and I would be interested to know what criteria is used to decide we are going to intervene on this one, but we're not going to intervene on that one. I think that's very helpful. Uh, other comments from members, Sean Robinson? I think in that letter we should reflect the discussion that we've had with the witnesses that acknowledge that the Scottish Government is not in a position to mitigate every UK government welfare reform. I think that should stated, but what we could think would be useful to ask is um, what assessment or are they going to do an assessment of the impact on um, support mechanisms that are already in place? So mm. the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, does the Scottish Government, uh, um, has, there, has there been any analysis of potential impact on the, the Welfare Fund from this this uh, impact on, on pension of poverty. Um, I think that would be helpful 
to to know particularly? I think that's quite important for consistency of the committee as well, because we, we, we've been asking the Scottish Government to keep under review yeah. the levels of the Scottish Welfare Fund and yeah. evidence this committee has as well as it's underspent across 32 local authorities. Some local authorities are putting additional monies to the Welfare Fund and others are not spending all the allocations they're given. So I think that that's a, a, a pretty useful uh, element to include within any letter. Additional comments to give us steer to the clerks who are going to have to draft this letter? Michelle? And I know Mr Brown is keen that I say something, so I will we'll respond to some of the, the questions that you're asking. And, and it, it builds on what I was saying earlier about, you know, should things be universal or should they be targeted at those who need them most, you know, those who are most vulnerable, those who find themselves in poverty. And the reality is the Scottish Government already do that. Um, discretionary housing payments are exactly that. They are discretionary ho housing payments. You have to apply for them and it looks at your, your income and your outgoings and decides whether you need that extra help. And it's on that basis that spare room subsidy is mitigated. It's not mitigated universally. Um, and I think the same applies when we're talking about something like this issue around pension credits. And what I want to do is have a, a really robust conversation around that and look at how we do that. And as a social security committee, I think that's really important because we can play politics around this room as much as we like and you, and you can attack me and I can have a go back at you, but it actually isn't going to help the people who actually need our help in terms of making sure that whatever we're doing is robust and is targeting the right people. <laughs> I mean, I, I personally don't feel if my husband retires not that he is, but, you know, he will retire before me. And I wouldn't necessarily feel that, therefore, he should get a lot of extra money when, as a household, we don't need it. I'd rather it went to a household that did need it. So I think, and I'm sure you would agree with me on that. So I, I think the conversations we're having here and when we're seeking evidence and when we're trying to find a way forward, we need to be focusing on this, not focusing on, on trying to knock lumps out of each other. Because you know, we can do that in the chamber, that's fine. But... In, in terms of the committee, we're here to really try and get underneath this, to really understand it and to make sure that every recommendation we make and every letter we write and everything we call for is backed by evidence. And we should all be able to support it because actually at the end of the day, if we've done our job properly, it should be hard to disagree with each other. And, and that is my view and I will hold that regardless of what gets said in here. And we are actually allowed to disagree with each other. We should always do it respectfully. Um, I, 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 across this place and for my part this is not about playing politics it's a protecting pension households that look set to lose £7,000 and be under the threat of, of, of sanction which is why I think the committee has has to move quickly on this it's also worth saying I think we should just check the factual situation before we put in any letter in relation to universality because actually uh, not everyone will automatically get pension credit. You've got a universal right to apply for it, but you won't, you, it's not a universal entitlement to receive it. So, for example, uh, if you have £16,000 worth of capital, you don't get it, for example. So it's not a universal benefit. And, say again? Sorry, so I just say it's, it's means-tested, but the yeah. rules don't, don't apply in pension credit. Ah, right. So, but it is means-tested, so right. it is only for low income. That, that, that's helpful. So I'm right and wrong at the same time. It is means tested, but the example I gave is not one of the, the tests that, that apply. So we should, that, that's all the more reason just to get the fact to get the factual situation. So that, 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 that illustrates the point. So are, are we saying to the Scottish Government we want to ask what assessment they have made of the impact uh, uh, on pension or poverty in relation to these changes in May the 15th? Are we saying to them what representations have they made to the UK government, what discussions have they had with the UK government? Are we going to ask them how they're seeking to engage with uh, the Scottish third sector in terms of uh, mapping out some of these issues and providing support where they can? And are we informing the Scottish government we've had a discussion in relation to mitigation? And the committee's actually got a few already that we don't actually expect the Scottish government to mitigate everything. But what we do ask them to do is to consider how they can assist. And mitigation may obviously be one of those options that, that can be used. So the committee's already got positions on this, and we have to certainly include that within any letter. It might be helpful to include <laughs> a letter to both Scottish and UK governments uh, that the 40% take-up rate of pension credit, they need to increase that, absolutely. 
and to get as many people as possible to apply for pension credit who might be impacted before that May the 15th deadline. I'm just putting all of this on the record because we have to give a steer to our clerking team to draft that letter, Michelle. Well, I, I don't know whether anybody else in here agrees. Maybe they don't. But I still think there is something as well about not just mitigation, but about design generally of the social security system going forward. Because I, I'm kind of hoping that the social security system of Scotland isn't just a, a kind of, well, we'll do what the UK do and we'll mitigate anything that they don't do. Because that isn't really a, a, a personalised system for Scotland. I, I, I think just, mm -hmm. just giving up, uh, the issue I'm trying to make is, is, is a larger one beyond this issue as well. Mm -hmm. And that is what thinking has been done at, at, at a higher level in regard to just mitigation policy in general. Mm -hmm. So not just specifically for this one benefit, but mm -hmm. just in general, what is the political, sorry, what is the government's thinking around mm -hmm. when we intervene and when we don't intervene? I is think, there a criteria yeah. around that? Well, because I think, you, I think you made that point quite powerfully and clearly at, 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 okay. the, at the start of your contribution. I'm seeking to draw this to a close pretty shortly. Keith, did you want to come back in? I'll certainly make it the last point that uh, I make, although I, I realise that we haven't, uh, and I did intend to and forgot to raise the issue of uh, severe disability, uh, which is also included within pension credits, and it'd be interesting if it's possible to add to the lengthening list of things that the clerks have to put into this letter, um, it'd be useful to have some clarity uh, around that, given um, some of the politics we saw in the chamber yesterday. But if I can just come back to the point, um, it seems to me that every time Westminster takes a decision like this, we immediately start looking at the Scottish Government and the Social Security system uh, and looking to see what it can do. And I understand that's the reason why, but we shouldn't take our focus away from where this has originated from. And I think that it's important that we do that. I think the point I raised, uh, the question that Michelle answered was actually a different question to the one I asked, but I think we got the answer. I do agree about the need for a debate about when a benefit should be universal and when it should be means tested. I, I think it's a perfectly legitimate debate. But I take it from that answer that it's your position, because this was the question I posed, that that stands instead of a commitment to maintain the mitigation that's currently there for council tax reduction, for bedroom tax mitigation, and and uh, for this measure. And I think that was important to get that. And the reason why it's important to get it is this committee is concerned with social security. The two systems are interrelated. We need to have an understanding of possible changes to future mitigation to mm. have a rounded view. That's why I wanted, but on that, uh, I won't say anything. I, 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 I now feel incumbent yeah. to, to let Michelle Ballantyne back in. But can I just make the point to committee members that this is a discussion about content of letters. I'm pretty sure we've got agreement in a letter to the Scottish Government, which will have to be circulated unanimously by committee. And we've got agreement the committee should state its view quite clearly to the UK Government. But uh, Michelle and Jeremy will have to make it clear that that's not what they sign up to. So we've actually well, we got... we have to see the letter first. So, so, yeah, so we've... Yeah, but yeah. I think the, the, the appropriateness mm -hmm. is that we'll reflect in that letter that you're, you've not signed up to that... Uh, to that. So we've actually got there in a respectful manner, but you were mentioned, Michelle, and it's only appropriate to give you the chance to respond, but then I mean, we really have to move on. What Keith is seeking is manifesto commitments, and clearly this is not the place I'm going to sit here and, and, and talk about manifesto commitments any more than you are if I started picking things and, and seeking them from you, because you'd have to go back and check with your party in general, I assume, unless you're a unilateral decision maker. I know I'm the chair of a committee, not, not a presiding officer, but... You, 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 let, let respectful. So it's okay. Keith and it's Michelle. But we're yeah. nearly there now. We've managed to do this respectfully. So, so do I well, bring you know, I, I am being perfectly we'll respectful, on. and I think we had that discussion at the last committee mm. meeting. So, but I think you know, I've, I've, I've made my personal views quite clear, um, and I think you know that's that's you know I can't mm. be any more clear than that. Mm -hmm. Can I thank all members? Um, for how we've conducted our business this morning and, and in public in, in a mature way. Strongly held views and we'll get the clerks to draft both those letters. Uh, thank you. And as we've already done, and I see they've, they've remained for the, for, for the, for the discussion, can, can I thank Rob Gowns and Adam Stakura for, for coming along and providing the information that inspired that, that discussion, did I say debate, that followed after um, the evidence session. But that does conclude Agenda Item 2 and we move to Agenda Item 3, which is subordinate legislation and can refer members to paper three, note by the clerk, the committee is invited to consider the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019, SSI 2019 forward slash 29, which is subject to the negative procedure. Is the committee content to note the instrument? 
and that unanimous declaration of contentment, may I thank everyone. Um, and we now move to agenda item four, which we've previously agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session.